I'd like to do a really quick review of the ideas that are in our chapter 20, uh, Thermodynamics. And the idea is, for any reaction, there are two big driving forces. Okay, one of those driving forces is entropy. And I found this really pretty picture on the internet. Uh, so entropy is kind of randomness, it's a disorder, and we like to call that spreadiness, and that things generally tend to get more and more and more random all the time. And that's kind of one driving force of the universe. The other one that we've seen is that things tend to go downhill energy-wise. And I found this nice little logo here. This is from a company. So for us, we actually would say that this is delta H. Okay, the... Uh, Enthalpy. So enthalpy is energy. Entropy is sort of a disorder or randomness. So these are the two big forces that we use. Now for enthalpy, we've learned about this before. Uh, this is all about, you know, if we have a, a chemical reaction and we're looking at the potential energy, does the potential energy drop during the reaction or does the potential energy go up? Okay, we would know that for this first case okay the delta H in this case would be a negative value because it was always the final minus the initial for this case here going uphill energy wise uh, the delta H would be a positive value now the, the idea is that for most reactions okay the big tendency is everything goes toward minimum enthalpy So if we put a ball on a hill, then we would expect for that ball to roll downwards. We just know that that's the way everything goes. Things tend toward the minimum potential energy, minimum enthalpy. Um, if we have a chemical reaction, we would know that uh, uh, heat on the right side would be the same thing as delta H being negative. Now for entropy, entropy is a tendency for disorder tendency for things to get more and more random as we go along. So this is a really cute cartoon from uh, S. Harris and the idea of this is the Department of Entropy. You can see all around the room things are just getting more and more random and disordered uh, just as you go along. Now for randomness, okay, with this has a symbol delta S um, and in this case here we use like Hess's law to figure out delta H's. You can also use Hess's law to figure out entropies. Two things to notice here. One is entropy. Every single chemical has an entropy. So if we were doing a problem before like uh, uh, methane plus two oxygens turns into CO2 and two H2Os, if we were doing a uh, uh, delta H calculation we would have a number for the compounds but not for the oxygen, uh, and that would show up later in the chemical. But if I were doing S's, I would have a value for uh, entropy for every single chemical, and then still products minus reactants, so that part's pretty much the same. The other thing to watch out for is uh, entropies are very, very, very often done in joules, okay, and it's usually joules per uh, Kelvin, uh, whereas delta H's are usually done in kilojoules. So the fact that this is joules, be careful, you're going to have to multiply by a thousand somewhere to get this to work out. Now, we put this all together, and the idea is that entropy tends to get more and more random. So that would be a positive delta S. So that would be a, a driver reaction. And we said that for delta H's, they tend to get uh, minimum energy that's a negative delta H. So if I have a situation where delta uh, H is negative, delta S is positive, then that reaction is definitely going to be product favored. And for some books they talk, they talk about that being spontaneous. So that means that the reaction is going to end up with lots of products. Now, if our two driving forces are opposite to this, so if I have a reaction that's endothermic, okay, it gets cold, then that is not a good driving force. 
and if at the same time it's getting less random, then there's no way that that reaction is going to be spontaneous. Okay, that is definitely going to be a reactant favorite. Reaction. And then the interesting ones, the ones that show up on tests all the time, are when both of these are negative or both of these trends are positive. And what that means is that one uh, trend says, you know, go forward and the other driving force says go backwards. So just to memorize, if it says minus and minus, that will be product favored at low temperatures. And if it's plus plus, that will be product favored at high temperatures. Now we're going to look at this more, okay, but the idea is to keep this whole chart in mind. This is a very, very useful chart. So if it's negative and it's positive, the negative delta H, that's good. Positive delta S, that's good. So those two driving forces will cause a reaction to happen. For example, burning something. If it burns, it gives off energy. It's exothermic. And things generally get more random, you know, like a piece of wood would turn into carbon dioxide and water. And so that reaction gets more random and it gives off energy. Both driving forces say go forward, so that's going to happen. If we say something like negative and negative, that means we have a situation that gives off energy, but it's getting less random. And that would happen in a situation, let's say, like uh, water. Okay, if water was going from uh, liquid to solid, then it's getting less random, but when it goes from liquid to solid, it gives off energy. Uh, turn that around. If I had a solid going to liquid, something melting, it'd be getting more random, okay, but it requires energy. So the randomness allows this to go uphill energy-wise, and uh, things would melt at high temperatures. And our case where we have things freezing, you know, that would happen at low temperatures. And then, again, this last case, is never going to be spontaneous. Now these can be put together into this really nice formula called Gibbs free energy. And uh, again these are like so you can see in the the uh, graphic here that it's in kilojoules per mole. Enthalpy uh, can be done in kilojoules per mole. Kelvin is in you know temperature Kelvin. Uh, but the entropy here, notice that that is in joules per mole. So be careful when you put numbers in, you're going to have to adjust the joules and the kilojoules to put them all together. Now, Gibbs free energy is kind of an odd uh, case, okay, that it's the energy that you could possibly get, the work you could possibly get from any system. And the big thing for us is the delta G could be negative, the delta G could be positive, or the delta G can be zero. Okay, negative is what we're usually looking for. Negative is a nice product favored reaction. Okay, a spontaneous reaction. So reactions that actually go have negative delta G's, and if you can get the delta G to be negative, then that is going to work. Um, a positive delta G is a reactant favored. So not only is it not going to go forward, it actually would go backwards. And when delta G is zero, that's an equilibrium situation. Now, to make it a little more concrete, I always think about a battery. Okay, if I have a negative delta G, that is a nice, fresh battery. You know, it is going to give me some work and that everything is good. If I have a delta G of zero, that's a dead battery. Okay, that's a battery that has... A, you know, reached equilibrium inside, there's no tendency for electrons to be gained or lost, so that, that's a dead battery. But a positive is a battery where it's nice and, and ready to do some work, only somebody has uh, labeled these incorrectly. They labeled the negative side positive and labeled the positive side negative, so it's going to go, but it's going to go in the opposite direction from what I think it's going to go. So dead battery would be at equilibrium. Now, I want to relate this formula here to the chart that we just did. So I'm going to write it back up here. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And I want to say, how can I get my delta G to be negative? Well, my first case, 
where this is negative, okay, that's exothermic, and this is positive, uh, the delta S is positive, where um, it's going to get more random, you can see mathematically that this is definitely going to make delta G negative. And since I'm doing minus a positive value, and the temperature, the T is Kelvin, and so, you know, Kelvin is always a positive value. So minus a positive value, this term is going to make the delta G negative. So for this case, we said this is going to be a negative delta G at all temperatures. So this situation is always going to be a nice spontaneous reaction. Now if they're both negative, mathematically we can see what's going to happen is this term is going to make delta G negative, but when I have minus, and the temperature is always a positive, so minus times a minus, that's going to make this positive, and that's going to work against my delta G being negative. So what I want to have happen is I want this value to be as small as possible. So if I have a very small temperature here, then that's going to make this term small. And so my negative uh, delta G can be negative because of my entropy of uh, my enthalpy term. So if it's negative negative, it'll be a, a spontaneous reaction at low temperatures. Now in the same way, if this is positive and positive, okay, if I'm going to use minus times a positive, that's going to make my delta G negative. Okay, my uh, positive delta H, that's going to work against me. So I want to use a large temperature here. So that'll make this term more important. And I can get a negative delta G if I have high temperatures. So when it's plus plus, that'll be spontaneous at high temperatures. And again, our last case here, if I say that this is positive and this is negative, so I have a reaction that's going uphill energy-wise and getting less random, there's no way, there's no temperature I can choose that is going to make my delta G negative. So my delta G can be negative in these three cases. If delta H is negative, delta S is positive. Or if it's negative, negative at low temperatures, positive, positive at high temperatures, those three cases can be a nice spontaneous reaction. Now the last little piece of this is, if we are saying that we have uh, low temperatures and high temperatures, you know, I have a situation where these are temperature dependent, that means in this first case, at low temperatures it will be spontaneous, and if I get high enough, it's going to stop being spontaneous. And in the same way, in this case here, high temperatures will be spontaneous, and there must be a cutoff that a certain, a certain low temperature, it will stop being spontaneous. So how can I find that cutoff temperature? And that's where the delta G being zero is so useful. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So if I had an equilibrium situation, like a boiling point, you know, at the boiling temperature or at the freezing temperature, or I want to say at what temperature is this going to change from being uh, spontaneous to non-spontaneous, I'm going to use delta G equals zero. So just a little algebra here, zero equals delta H minus T delta S. So we can see what's going to happen. I'm going to move my T delta S to the other side. So T delta S equals delta H. Now solve for T. So the temperature at which a reaction just begins to be spontaneous or just stops being spontaneous will be delta H divided by delta S. So if I work that out, I can find the temperature at which things change, and that's really useful. Now, just remind again, when you actually try to do these problems, your delta H is going to be in kilojoules, okay, kilojoules per mole, and your delta S is going to be in joules, okay, and again, that's going to be joules uh, per Kelvin. So you're going to have to take, and take your kilojoules and multiply by 1,000, or take your joules and divide by a thousand, but you're going to have to do that before you combine those terms. Those are the main ideas here in chapter 19.